Good afternoon and welcome to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Monday, March 28th, 2022. Um, welcome to the committee. Let the record show that there is a quorum present. Uh, today, our first bill up on the agenda is Senate File 2642. Senator Rarick, this bill will be laid over. Senator Rarick, when you're ready, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, Senate File 2642 is a, a pretty simple bill. Um, it helps to clarify the rules regarding the repairing or sealing of drainage holes in a reinforced concrete tank. Uh, the holes would be used or are used to ensure the quality of the septic tank that is stored outside on a lot uh, before being used. That is a hole that's put in place to drain out any uh, water. So as we're approaching fall and winter, um, it would not freeze and potentially crack the tank. Um, the hole is then sealed before it is put in. Um, when it was, this was brought to my attention, it seemed like a very common sense thing. And as someone in construction, I know uh, the concrete can be repaired quite easily uh, on this system that is not under any pressure or anything. Um, but I have a testifier here who can speak much better uh, to the issue than I can. So Madam Chair, I would like to turn it over to my testifier at this point. Uh, thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, I believe Dave Christensen. Yes. Um, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is David Christian. I am a uh, quality control officer for Bill's Auto Products of Minnesota. I'll proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't want to eat up a lot of your time and I thank you for giving us this time to speak. The packet we sent out to you today clarifies a lot of details about the use of these drainage holes. We're not gonna go through all of it because it's just to back up the points that we're going to cover today. Now throughout the industry, drainage holes are used to preserve the quality of tanks. And it's been our belief that this has been the case throughout our state and other states. Um, the first point we'd like to cover of course, is that the bill we've presented will clarify the use of these holes and how they are sealed and repaired before use in, before the tank itself goes into use. Uh, the second point we're going to cover, of course, is why these uh, drainage holes are needed. And finally, what we hope to accomplish by adding this wording to the existing rules provided by the MCA. As we all know, being Minnesotans, ice and snow can cause untold damage to property and uh, structures throughout our state, anywhere across the snow belt for America. What we hope to do is mitigate that damage to limit what expansion and contraction of ice throughout the winter months can do to one of our tanks being stored outside. To do this, we need to relieve the water pressure that builds up in the tanks. And there are a few ways that this can be done, but the easiest and most cost-effective way is to simply add a small drainage hole. And before the tank goes in the ground, make sure that it's repaired or sealed to standards that meet or exceed the MPCA's requirements. Now to meet these requirements, we have done extensive studies and experimentation, and we've documented them fully. We've gone step by step to fill a tank with water to make sure that it's watertight. We have placed it under a vacuum to make sure that it's airtight. And we've met the minimum requirements and exceeded them in both sets of tests, um, proving that the repairs that we do before these tanks go into operation are solid and trustworthy and something that the industry can rely on. Now, in years past, other industries, other people may have done different things, but new technology, new, new steps and practices. We use a mastic substance created here by 3M. Is it designed to adhere to concrete, to give a chemical seal and make sure that it will withstand the use in septic systems. We also use a plug designed to be chemically resistant and stand the pressures that these tanks will be under and far exceed the pressures these tanks will be under. As our engineers have proven, the amount of pressure to pull these seals out 
would exceed the pressure that the tanks themselves could hold. So literally the tank would crumble before the seal would come out. Um, so what we're hoping today is to simply add some literature to the existing rules that seals and repairs that have been tested to this level could be accepted and the tanks that they're put in be put into operational use. Uh, that should about cover everything. If you have any questions, I could go over them for you, uh, why their use is or if there's anything you need clarification on. Thank you, Mr. Christian. I think we'll have um, Ms. Vanderbosch um, up to the table and then we'll take questions. Okay. Ms. Vanderbosch, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record and proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dana Vanderbosch, and for the record, that's V-A-N-D-E-R-B-O-S-C-H. And I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Water Policy and Agriculture at the MPCA, and I'm here to uh, express concerns with Senate File 2642 today. Ms. Um, Vanderbosch, could you pull the um, microphone just a little closer, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our primary concern with um, the tanks that are being described today, tanks that are uh, precast concrete that have had holes drilled into them and have been patched and sealed and then put into use is really um, as they're used as a septic tank, as part of a septic system. And our primary um, concern about allowing this practice of drilling holes into that septic tank and patching it is that it puts the homeowner at risk. Um, a septic tank is part of a, a septic system, which is used to treat wastewater. It's essentially a mini wastewater treatment facility that is in your backyard. And when you drill the holes into the tank, you're really compromising the tank's integrity. And we haven't seen research or information that really provides assurance that the patches or the seals around those patches remain intact once the tank is installed and underground and um, that it stays leak proof. Leak, leak proof throughout the septic system's useful life, which is about 30 years if the system is properly maintained. Now, wastewater contains pathogens and bacteria in addition to nutrients and other chemicals like chlorides. And so a septic system with a leaking sewage tank that, um, that leaks, a, a septic tank that leaks can uh, release raw or partially treated wastewater into the surrounding soils the groundwater and possibly even nearby waters if the parcel of property is located near a lake or near a stream or river. And this poses a threat to human health and the environment. In the instances of such tanks that we have seen stored in yards, there have been more than one tank or one, more than one hole that has been drilled into it. There have been several drainage holes drilled into them. And so each one of these holes would provide an opportunity for raw wastewater to um, enter the soils and into the groundwater. If the homeowner also has a private drinking water well, a leaking septic tank can also contaminate their drinking water well over the long life of the septic system. And again, those septic systems can last for up to 30 years. And so if you've got a slow leak that's just going on and on undetected, that can pose a, a threat to the drinking water well. Um, if the tank does leak at some point after installation, the homeowner would bear that financial burden of replacing or repairing it. So because of the potential consequences, it's really critical that we are really, really sure that these kinds of patch tanks are actually seal tight and leak proof for the 30 years or so that they're going to be in use. We don't have data about the long-term fate of these kinds of tanks. To gather that kind of data, someone would need to monitor a number of these installed tanks across Minnesota so that you, you understand the differences, uh, how those tanks perform across our various different soils. Um, and you'd have to do it for 20 to 30 years so that you really understand what the long-term performance of these tanks are. And this has never been done by the PCA or by tank manufacturers that we're aware of. And that's our concern. Our concern is really the long-term performance of the seals around these patches. The tests that have been shown to us on how the plug will perform are short-term and in the most ideal circumstances in laboratories. Um, in one test instance that we read about, a hole was slightly oversized. You know, the quality control of those holes is not always perfect or exact. And so the plug came out easier and faster um, than the rest of the holes that were tested. So you can imagine if you had you know, if the quality control on some of these holes and some of these patches is not perfect and spot on, 
then that particular tank could leak. And because we don't have long-term data on the performance of these patched holes, we, did, we have had conversations with tank manufacturers, what their experience has been. And they told us that they supported not allowing this practice. The manufacturers who no longer place drainage holes in their tanks stated the reason why they don't do this is because that follow-up inspections of those tanks after they had been installed in the ground was demonstrating that they were leaking. So they discontinued that practice. We have had some enforcement cases on tanks like these that have been installed. And in one recent case, we were able to actually witness that the leakage from the septic tank was, was flowing out of those weep holes where the patches had failed. So when we gather together the information that we don't have about the long-term performance and some of the testimony that we have from homeowners who have had you know, failed tanks and tank manufacturers themselves, that's really led us to take the most protective approach for the homeowner and the environment of not registering these tanks on the state level. Now, Minnesota counties and other local units of government um, are the ones that actually administer our SSTS program rules on the local level. So they enforce the rules, they review the plans, they conduct inspections, they approve permits. And currently state law does allow those local units of government to, to um, approve tanks like this. These tanks are considered unregistered, but those LGUs can go ahead and they can allow their use. What it would require was that the local unit of government approve those tanks and that they also get a professional engineer to agree with the approval to agree that the tank specifications are protective of human health and the environment. This bill would actually change that and neither the MPCA nor local governments would be able to you know, approve or deny the use of these tanks. The statute would allow these tanks to be used um, regardless of, of what they're seeing on the local level when they're being installed. Which leads us really to our final concern, which is that the bill doesn't contain minimum standards or other requirements for how the holes should be sealed to assure that they remain watertight for the life of the septic system. Now, some tank manufacturers may have very solid patching and sealing approach, but the next tank manufacturer may not. You know, there's a large number of ways that the holes can be patched. There's different sealants that can be used and there would be really no quality control with minimum standards um, in that bill. So that's our, that's our concern too. And in closing, I wanna thank the author, Senator Rarick, for uh, meeting with me and my colleagues this morning. I appreciated his willingness to hear our concerns and thank you to this committee for allowing me to testify today. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Christian, uh, the product that you use, how long has that been available? Mr. Christian. Uh, for quite a while now, uh, we've been using mastic rope to seal the tanks. Uh, for as long as I've worked in the industry, it's been used to seal the upper portion of the tanks, as well as any breaches that we needed to patch or around the pipe entry way. It's used often there as well to seal it. It is a uh, very adhesive substance and it's chemically resistant. It's perfect for the job it was intended for to seal septic systems. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so have you had occasion to dig uh, up a, a tank or dig down by a tank with this product used and with the, um, for whether it's for the other uses or whether it's for the sealing plug uh, in the course of your business? Mr. Uh, Christian. In the course of my time working with the Delzados, I have not dug into a tank in the field but we have done extensive uh, yearly tests on the ability for these tanks to hold vacuum and hold water above the mastic line. So to prove the fact that it can hold a tight seal, even under pressure. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And do you know, has the manufacturer uh, provided any type of testing information as it relates to its exposure to uh, substance similar to septic water, for example. Mr. Christian. Yes, uh, the 3M product that we use has been tested to be chemically resistant and is used in septic systems across the industry. It's a very common product for us to use. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the, uh, to the representative of the MPCA, so have you reviewed the, um, or the um, manufacturer's tests as it relates to this product? Ms. Vanderbosch. 
Madam Chair, committee members, we have, and this is, um, th these are good examples of what I was referring to, where these are short-term tests that have been done under laboratory specifications. And so they're, we just don't believe that they are representative of how the tank will perform once it's installed in the ground and it's filled with raw wastewater and it's performing for 20 to 30 years. It's the long-term performance of those seals that is of concern. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what is your definition of short-term test? Ms. Von Brash. Well, I don't know the specific duration of all the tests that have been submitted to us, but most of the ones that you know we have seen have been you know hours, days, that type of duration. Senator Weber. And thank you, Madam Chair. And so, and in these tests, I, it was indicated that there are a lot of times there's a vacuum, there's pressure, there's probably greater pressure applied than what you would experience in the normal usage. Um, you know, so at what point does that come into play uh, uh, as it relates to your consideration of that test? Ms. Vanderbosch. Madam Chair, um, Senator Weber, I do have the manager of our SSTS program here who's probably more knowledgeable about these various different tests, and I'd be happy to have her come up if she could give you more specifics on this. Okay. Senator Weber? Please, I'd like to... Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Courtney Allers Nelson. I'm the Assistant Division Director for the Municipal and Industrial Divisions and serve as the manager for the SSTS program at the MPCA. Um, could you just state your last name again? I'm yes. sorry, I did not quite catch it. Allers Nelson. Okay, thank you. Proceed. So, Senator Weber, uh, I think it's a good question. Those uh, those tests are in rule and we require that um, pressure tests be used and to the credit of um, the testifier here and the company that he works for, these tests were um, well done. But we still, uh, as I wanna underscore the point that um, Assistant Commissioner Vanderbosch was making is that we don't have the long-term data on these, on the results of those tests that would make us um, consider uh, approving these to, so that they were put onto a registered tank list at the MPCA. Nevertheless, I also wanna add um, to the statement that Commissioner Vanderbosch had, which is that these tanks can already be used, assuming that local into government and a professional engineer would sign off on them to be used. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, um, it was indicated uh, by Ms. Vanderbosch that, that there have been, uh, in, in testing, there have been instances whereby uh, there have been leaks from holes that have been plugged or something similar to that effect. Do you know in those instances was the product that the current that the manufacturer at the table is using, was that the same product that was used in those scenarios? Ms. Ellis Nelson. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. What I know are two things. In absence of having good tests, the MPCA consulted with manufacturers across the state when this rule was written. And at the time, those manufacturers said that putting holes below the waterline and sealing them up did not secure those tanks and make them watertight for the lifetime of those tanks. That's where that rule has originated from and based upon. With additional information, um, the agency is, is uh, open to uh, approving these tanks, assuming that local units of government and engineers would sign off on them. For the tanks that I know of, that we where we have seen um, leaks, um, they resulted from enforcement cases where, again, uh, we know that someone was uh, putting holes below the waterline and putting those tanks into place. And uh, we, we did see um, that uh, septage seeped out of those tanks and into soils. I do not know that the product was exactly the same as what is being discussed today. Um, and for that matter, I don't know, again, um, that if we, uh, based on the testimony provided already, 
that uh, the company themselves has evidence that these plugs in the ground um, can uh, stay put for a long period of time, since it sounds like they themselves have not had um, the results of in-field testing. Okay. Senator Weber. Uh, I, I think I'm finished for right now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I do have a, a few questions. I, I was interesting to know that we're wor worried about well contamination. And um, in, in my district, uh, we do wells and septics every day. And it's ve a very uh, strict standards and requirements about how far the wells and the septics are. And I was really surprised that you would be concerned about that. And in every um, property that I've seen, the well is a, a great distance uh, from, from the septic tank. Ms. Vanderbilt, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Alex Nelson. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I'm not sure I, I, I fully got the question there, but I, I think you're interested in our concern about um, wells potentially being contaminated given yes, the uh, proposed product is, here. Yeah, I mean, concern is that there's, that the statement made that there was a concern about contamination when we have very strict rules about the distance between the tanks and the, and the, uh, and the well. And so I'm, I'm interesting on where that statement came from. Sure. If I may respond. Thank yes. you, Madam Chair. Um, those rules are in place, assuming that um, the existing SSTS rules are followed. So the setbacks are in place, um, assuming that there are no holes in these septic tanks below that water line at operating um, depth. And so the setbacks are um, oftentimes made to be uniform to work for most people around the state of Minnesota. But we know that geology and soils vary across the state. And so uh, the concern would be that if suddenly you have a non-conforming, a non-compliant SSTS tank that is leaking, it may uh, eventually migrate through those soils and through groundwater laterally uh, to reach a uh, groundwater well. And so um, a couple of assumptions are made. One, the SSTS tanks are, um, do not have those holes in them. And, and two, we're assuming that groundwater moves at various rates through, across the state, but enough for there to be a risk. Um, thank you. I, I just find that very interesting when we're so very um, careful about that, that that would now be a concern with these tanks. Um, my other question is that um, much to our chagrin, um, when we um, have to um, have septic tanks tested now, we are forced to pump them dry, which of course uh, is a very um, uh, problematic uh, for us, especially in the winter when we have empty tanks that it, you know, it, it's, it's I, I think we've all expressed, uh, expressed our concerns in greater Minnesota that that's not something that we should be doing. Um, but when we do that, now we have an empty tank. Have you seen, I, I've not had any installers come to me and say that they're, uh, they found leakage in tanks. And if they do, it has to be reported because that's what they're doing. They're, they're inspecting the tanks. And so have you found a lot of folks coming to you that now that we have to empty the tanks completely, you can see what's in the bottom of the tank that, that they're leaking? Ms. Hollis. Thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. I do not have data on the number of times that we have seen that tanks are leaking. If you're referring to leaking as a result of these holes put into place, I, I just really want to stress that currently these holes uh, and then sealing and repairing them is not required and or is not al allowed by the rules. Um, in those rare instances I talked about, they can be approved by a local use of government. But we um, as a result, necessarily wouldn't find that leaking to be a result of those holes because they should not be in place in the first place. Um, but if you're interested in, in additional data on how often we find leaky tanks, I'm happy to provide that to you and the committee. Thank you, Ms. Sollers. I would be interested in the data of leakage from these um, plugs. Um, with that, members, are there additional questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, obviously, in terms of how a septic system works, uh, the water rises to a certain level and then it is discharged into a drain field uh, at some point. And so there's a connection at 
that stage where it the water rises to a point where it goes into the drain field. And so, um, uh, Mr. Christian, it, it, are you saying that the connection that for that part of it is the same type of material as what's used for the plug? Mr. Christian. Yes, that is correct, sir. The uh, top of the tank is used, we use a mastic rope seal, and that is the same substance we use um, during our testing to seal the plug, the little quarter inch hole at the bottom of the tank for the drainage is filled with mastic and then the plugs pushed in and then rubber mallet put into place. Um, it is the same substance we use at the top of the tank and sometimes around the inlet and outlet pipes to seal the hole to keep the uh, septic uh, tank sealed and the fluid inside where it belongs. Senator Weber. And um, to the MPCA, um, in your the times that there have been testings, have, have you seen that material fail in, in those instances? Every, any time that there's been a, a check on the, um, with a complaint on, on, a, on a tank? Ms. Allers Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. You know, regarding the uh, substance that is being discussed now, I, I do not have data on how often it fails or, or stays intact. I think the bigger uh, concern is that the bill language doesn't provide that type of specification. Um, and so this um, company may uh, be doing the right thing and using the appropriate materials, but the concern would be that another manufacturer or installer may not. Um, there currently is nothing in the bill language that um, tells us how they should be appropriately sealed or not. Um, but to your very, uh, your question there, I do not have data on the use of that. It sounds like it's a 3M product. Senator Weber. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess, you know, we're always told that we always use the best science and yet, you know, I, I'm not sure the science has been found in regards to this particular issue, but I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rarick in closing. Oh, Senator sure. Sendum. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, uh, so I have to understand this a little bit. Uh, and, and, and I think we're just talking theory here, uh, honestly. I mean, I, I do look at these, these look like, uh, like plugs that, that, you know, it's much like putting a nail in a, in a, in a hole and, and with epoxy around it and letting that cure and, and settle. It's going to last for who knows a thousand years. Uh, but, and so we're all worried about, I don't know, three drops an hour, maybe leaking through this. And it's not going to happen. We know that. Uh, but, but then of course, you know, the water going to the drain field is, and I'm a, I'm an old bacteriologist. I mean, that's, that's full of, that's full of coliforms and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it, and so it, it's, it's like the coliforms can't leak through this small little maybe pinhole, if you will, at the bottom of the tank, but it's all right to drain them into a drain field. And yeah, I, I know it percolates through a mound and so on. And we presumed as, uh, as much as we're able that uh, somehow the, the, the soil bacteria are gonna take care of these coliforms and all will be well. And they, of course, these mounds never get saturated. So our groundwater is always protected. We know that. Uh, I'm being a little facetious, but, but, but I think we have to be when we talk about the practicality of what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's just an almost infinitesimal risk, I think, and, you know, compared to, to, frankly, what goes into the drain field and, and, and frankly, what is you know, becoming potentially part of our groundwater. Uh, and especially if these mounds get old and saturated and so on and so forth, uh, or if they're not the, you know, the right depth in terms of, of, of percolation or whatever those words are. So, I mean, th those are my comments. I, I just think we're talking about a risk here that's, that's almost infinitesimal. And we're, we're, we're here at a hearing today kind of worried about it, but we don't care about all that drain, you know, the water going into the drain field, because that's okay. Because we, we know that's going to be taken care of. Well, obviously we don't know that. Not in every case. So, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Senator Sengen. Senator Rare, closing comments. Oh, Senator Hur. Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment as well. Um, and, and for sure, I 
don't know about septic tank as much as um, you, Madam Chair, and Senator Weber, um, being that, you know, I, I'm live mostly part of Metro, um, but I do have concern on the, um, the spill of it if it get to our drinking water. Um, my, my, my question will be to um, Mr. Christian, how often or how many, how many clients or how, how often do you service people on, on putting the plug into the, the septic tank? Mr. Christian. That is an excellent question. Though we've seen it to be a common practice throughout the industry, um, it is not commonly used. So of the tanks that go into the field, maybe a hundred since 2013 were produced. And of that hundred, 25, of that 25 tanks that were produced in the winter, when it might, might be necessary to protect them from snow and ice, maybe five, maybe four. Yeah. Sure. But so we're talking about a small number of tanks needing to be protected from our environment so that later they can be safe to use because that ice that builds up inside them can cause micro fractures and cracking along the side that isn't visible until you fill it with water and you look at the side of the tank 24 hours later to look for weeping and that will show signs of that kind of damage. But to the untrained eye, it's gonna look like a perfectly normal tank. And by doing a simple little drainage hole, we can prevent that kind of damage from ending up in someone's yard in a tank that looked like it was perfectly usable. Senator Herr. Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Christian, for the answer. You know, it's pretty much where sign and practicality come together. Uh, I, I heard uh, um, Ms. Vanderbilt, or I, I sorry, I, I did couldn't get your name earlier, but uh, from the MPCA that um, if the language could be specified a little further, you know, it, it could, it could be, it could move forward, right? You know, I mean, um, is that what you're talking about, ma'am? Ms. Sellers Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Hurt. I think uh, I wanna say thank you to the bill author for meeting with us to discuss some of our concerns this morning. And we did express that we would be interested in doing rulemaking should this bill uh, move forward in the, with the language um, it's currently in um, because we would really appreciate adding some specifications to the vague and bit ambiguous language that exists now. Um, again, perhaps um, the company that Mr. Christensen works for is doing the right thing, but we would need to um, spend some time looking at that and developing alternatives for others. Senator Herb. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Nelson. I, uh, just my thinking alone that this is a remote case, um, small but we need to address it and and um you know perhaps as it move forward as it lay over um senator rarick and uh you know the committee or wherever we go may may want to improve the language so that you know it it could accommodate what mr christian is trying to achieve so thank, thank you mr. senator with that, Senator Rare, closing comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and yes, we had uh, those conversations this morning. Uh, I did speak with the staff. Um, we do believe at this point that there would be uh, rulemaking allowed. Um, it, the case was brought up that maybe somebody would try to stick a cork in it or something. And I think, you know, that is definitely something that through rulemaking, they could say, no, that's not acceptable. Um, we will look to see if there is anything that we can put in there. Um, but I think one of the things for me and why this bill made sense and why I uh, brought it forward, um, we have professionals in the industry that have designed and developed these tanks. They know more than anybody else does about this. And when they say they can put a small hole in it to protect its integrity and then they can patch it, I believe them. And I sometimes find it insulting. I realize there are bad actors out there, but I find it insulting that that sometimes gets put to everybody in the industry. 
this bill makes sense. And I believe the vast majority of the people in these industries want to provide a good product to their customers and they are gonna do everything in their power to do just that. And Madam Chair, I guess I will end my comments there, but I appreciate you uh, hearing the bill. Thank you, Senator Eric. And thank you to all of our testifiers today. It was a great conversation and I hope working, going forward, we can, we can work on maybe some um, language and uh, get this done. So with that, Senate File 2642 is laid over. Thank you. And I will hand the gavel to Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will turn to Senate File 3701. Uh, that uh, is uh, Senator Rood's bill, and uh, this bill will be going to the full finance committee. We will be voting on this to take it out of committee to the full finance, finance committee. Um, welcome, uh, Senator Rood, and please proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Senator Weber. Um, I have the A1 amendment. It is a delete all, and it is an author's amendment. Okay, uh, you have heard the author's amendment. Uh, it's a delete all A1 amendment. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Please proceed, Senator Root. Thank you, Senator Weber and committee members. Well, this is the annual Outdoor Heritage um, Council. It's the Lasard Sam's bill. We have already heard this in committee. But as many of you know, um, we have um, more funds available to us. And so the Lasard Sam's Council um, um, put more money into each project. I think they did a really good, thoughtful job. And this, um, the language that we adopted today will is um, mirrors the house language so that we can um, get this done. Um, and uh, I have a very good uh, testifier today, if you would, Mr. Chair. Okay, very good. And uh, with that, uh, we will proceed to uh, Mark Johnson uh, to testify concerning this bill. Mr. Chair, members, thank you very much. With me today is uh, Joe Pavelko, the Assistant Director for the Lasard Sands Outdoor Heritage Council. Um, the, uh, the author, Chair Rood, did mention exactly what this is. It's the uh, same bill as we have already heard with the Outdoor Heritage with uh, Representative, or it's, pardon me, Senator Lang's bill. And um, with the addition of, there are actually three changes uh, with, uh, from that bill that also in this case creates a perfect mirror to the house bill that's there. The first is the amount of, of funding which uh, Senator Rood had mentioned and that is that it's about $3.7 million more. The council actually back in December uh, at that time in preparation in case there would be an increase or decrease in the funding for the uh, February forecast had provided guidance for staff directing us that if there was an overage, we want it proportionally distributed amongst the um, projects just the same as, we, as they had done. And if there's an underage, we want that also proportionally subtracted. So staff did that. We provided it back to the council for their approval again and acknowledgement and that we have. The uh, second thing is there is a small, um, uh, a very small, uh, what do you call it, uh, corrective language which was on uh, page 19, it was in underneath 19.26. I think the language is actually in 19.33 and 19.34 for the record. And all I did was it made a, it corrected in a, a, a tiny bit of language um, that was not quite appropriately listed before by us, by staff, by uh, Lassard Sam staff. So that made that correction. And then the final thing that it does uh, from the, uh, uh, previous bill by Senator Lang is that it adds in on the final page, page 26, there is a an extension to the, uh, which starts on 26.18, line 26.18. It's an availability of appropriation. It's an extension until 2025 for the Carnelian Creek Conservation Corridor um, project that they're working on. So, and that is, uh, there was a letter from our chair and vice chair that we're stating again, or from our chair actually to the authors and to the leadership um, stating that this was a non-controversial 
uh, addition or amendment, saying they were definitely in favor of that. And um, speaking for the council, and also chair, that's Chair Hartwell, Vice Chair uh, Shera was also brought into that conversation with uh, Chair Hartwell for that determination. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, would you, if you'd like, I can go into different uh, details in the bill, but otherwise we will stand for questions for you if that's okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Members, are there any questions? Senator Herr. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rood, uh, I, I'm just comparing the note on the uh, original bill and the delete all, you know, the original bill uh, specify funding for a web page uh, and then and itemize it, but uh, I wonder, is that it, anywhere in the amendment? Senator Rood? Uh, Senator Hur, no, this, we used um, this bill um, and as a delete all for the Lassart Sam. So that is not included in this bill. Okay. Okay. So there's no website de design or improvement in the new language at all. Senator Rood? Senator Hur, no. Just thought I'd check, thank you. <laughs> Okay, any other questions, senators? Hearing none, uh, Senator Root, any final comment? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I just really wanna, um, this is a great bill they put in. I know I, I, I said this before, I see Senator Lang walking around with these big three ring notebooks and they look at all the projects and they rank them and they do a tremendous amount of work to get this bill in the shape that it's in. And so I wanna thank Senator Lang and all the bill authors for their tremendous um, work. And also uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Pidelko for what they do for the um, Lassart Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. I know they work very hard and every year they bring us an amazing uh, product that uh, very, is very uncontroversial and it has great bipartisan support when it gets to us. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, very good. Uh, if there's no further comment, uh, at this point, Senator Rood moves that the Senate file 3701 be recommended to pass as amended and be sent to the Finance Committee. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. With that, I'll turn the gavel back to you, Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, now we'll have a presentation on a, a CWD update from the Department of Natural Resources. As many of you may or may not know, we had a recent outbreak in the Grand Rapids area. And so um, today we're just gonna get an update on what's going on in the field out there. And so um, who is gonna testify? Uh, Commissioner Meyer? I'll just start us off. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. We have with us online Dr. Michelle Carson Senate and uh, Dave Ophill, Director of Fish and Wildlife, for questions. Um, but Michelle is going to run through the PowerPoint in your package. So, um, Madam Chair, if we could bring her up or. Thank you. Thank um, you. Dr. Carstensen, welcome to the committee. Um, please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, my name again is Dr. Michelle Carstensen, and I am the uh, Wildlife Health Supervisor with Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Um, let's see. Is that uh, available for everyone to see? Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sorry I couldn't be there in person today. Um, so I'm going to share with you a brief update um, and cover these four areas. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the uh, recap of this past fall to bring everyone up to speed on where we're at currently with the CWD footprint in Minnesota, and then talk about the current events going on right now, which includes our culling operation in southeast Minnesota, where we've had persisting disease, um, the new Grand Rapids positive, and our initial response. Um, as well as some of our approaches to statewide surveillance um, that we anticipate uh, this coming fall and some of our uh, anticipated needs. Um, CWD has been found 
in 12 captive service facilities since 2002. The most recent was in Beltrami County. And in this map I've provided, they highlight uh, as green counties. Uh, in addition, uh, we've sampled uh, about 106,000 deer since we began testing wild deer since 2002. Currently, we have 158 positives that we've detected in our white-tailed deer population. Uh, they are displayed on this map as yellow dots. Uh, the majority of these detections have been in southeast Minnesota. In addition to deer, we also have two other susceptible species in the state. That includes our uh, wild elk population in the northwest. We have been testing uh, individuals that are harvested or found dead in that population since 2004 and have not detected any prion disease, any CWD. And we've also been testing moose uh, since the early 2000s with over 350 moose uh, sampled in uh, mostly the northeastern part of the state and have not found any detections in moose. This past fall, we had a footprint that included six areas of the state that we were gonna do uh, chronic wasting disease surveillance, uh, both in management zones where the disease has been found in the wild and we were responding to that, as well as surveillance areas where disease was found in captive service facilities. And we were doing some precautionary testing around those areas. We sampled about 15,000 deer um, and we had 31 new detections. Uh, these in included, again, areas where we knew the disease existed, uh, predominantly in southeast Minnesota, where 28 new cases were found, two in the south metro, this is uh, zone 605 near Dakota County, and we had one additional detection in 604, which is in the Brainerd area. Um, we also had a new detection um, that was outside of our uh, planned surveillance in Polk County, and I'll get back to that in, in a couple slides. Um, we spent approximately 1.6 million in our, uh, our fall work. And again, this is a tremendous effort of staff and students that work together with over 263 DNR staff participating at, at check stations and 181 students from colleges and universities across the state. Um, the, the deer that I mentioned in Polk County was actually a, a, a sample submitted by a hunter on his own uh, from uh, his daughters during youth season. And uh, they submitted samples to Colorado State University. And lo and behold, one was found positive for chronic wasting disease. This was uh, in the Red River Valley, right on the border of North Dakota. We have not had any recent sampling in this area. So we adjusted as quickly as possible to collect some additional samples during the firearm season. And we were able to collect about 238 samples um, in the Minnesota side. And North Dakota hunters also participated on their side of the border and collected an additional 92 samples. We did not detect chronic waste and disease in any of the deer that we tested in this additional sampling, but we'll have some more work to do this coming fall to assess if there is disease uh, still in this area and what that footprint might look like. The discovery of both the positive wild deer in Polk County and the farm I mentioned in Beltrami County last year did expand our footprint of uh, deer feeding and attractant bands to 44 counties in the state of Minnesota. Uh, so we have these new counties added again in response to these new detections. And this includes counties where feeding is restricted and counties where also the use of attractants are restricted. And that's again, where the disease has been confirmed in the wild. And this is to mitigate risks of deer coming in close concentration together and potentially exacerbating disease on the landscape. We're currently working in Southeast Minnesota on a culling operation. This is our fifth year. We've been working uh, in the Fillmore County and Winona County areas. Our efforts here are really a, a targeting areas where the disease was discovered this past fall uh, and really using this tool as a very surgical instrument to try to take out uh, deer that are in close proximity to where other positives have been found and remove some additional affected deer from the landscape. Um, this is where the, the risk would be the highest. Uh, we're also participating in a research project that was funded by um, USDA on looking at relatedness of these deer, trying to ensure uh, that we are taking out uh, deer that are, again, more highly related and more likely to be related to positives, and then looking at some of the genetic footprint of those individuals and comparing that to other ongoing research. 
So far, we have removed uh, 239 deer through the end of last week. We did remove, um, sorry, we did remove additional 80 deer just this last week. Uh, and we have been finding a higher percentage of positives than we do in our normal fall hunter harvest surveillance. And again, that's by design. We are absolutely targeting the areas of this heightened risk and trying to remove deer as close to those areas as possible. And so here we have 6% of total deer that were culled um, are positive again, compared to that larger population level surveillance we do in the fall, which really demonstrate that this is a very effective tool to remove positive off the landscape. And again, reduce that transmission risk that these animals would have had they survived into the next hunting season, which is our next opportunity to harvest these animals. Um, all of the venison that goes into this program after the test results are back and the results are not detected are made available to the public. Uh, we have a share of the harvest program where anybody can sign up and request venison. And we have a contractor uh, meat processor that's working with us out of Spring Valley, Minnesota, where uh, this, uh, these animals are processed and then again uh, provided to members of the public that, that have an interest. And any of the positive animals that we identify, we recover um, the meat from those individuals and that's disposed of through the University of Minnesota's alkaline digester. The most recent detection we had, um, again, occurred in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. This was just last month where a homeowner reported a, a deer that appeared suddenly, died overnight on the property, and reported this to DNR uh, inside the metro area of Grand Rapids. A local manager responded to that report, collected the carcass as well as samples for basic chronic waste and disease rule out, which is part of our surveillance strategy across the state as we test deer that are either died in suspicious circumstances or demonstrate any clinical signs of illness that could be consistent with CWD. We did get results that this animal was preliminary positive on March 8th, and we still had the carcass um, remaining in our possession at the Grand Rapids headquarters uh, waiting those test results. We were able to bring the carcass down to the University of Minnesota and have a full necropsy performed. Um, the pathologist that examined that carcass believed the animal died from vehicle, uh, vehicle collision. It had um, internal trauma consistent with that, but was in otherwise generally good health meaning the CWD uh, detection was more incidental and had not manifested into clinical signs in that animal yet. And, uh, and so we had the animal was confirmed again March 15th, and we haven't really had any recent sampling occurring in this deer permanent area, which is 179 in the last 10 years or more. Um, we have been working quite a bit more to the south uh, uh, west where the Brainerd uh, disease was discovered a few years back, but in the Grand Rapids Metro, this area hasn't had any recent sampling. So what we're doing right now is uh, working in a local response. So we are looking to um, collect samples from road roadkill deer that are available uh, in the Grand Rapids uh, metro area, as well as the surrounding community. Um, we're encouraging uh, members of the public to report any sick deer that they may see to DNR. And we've just begun last night, a uh, localized culling effort. That's actually where I'm calling from today. I'm in Grand Rapids as we just kicked this off. Um, we've been uh, working to remove deer again in a very localized area around two miles of this positive. And again, that's trying to reduce that transmission of potential prions to other deer in that immediate area. Given this was an adult female with a pretty small home range, uh, the animals that are within two miles of it would be at that heightened risk. Um, positives, again, will be removed. Um, and brought down to the digester if we find any, and any not detected deer are gonna be made available for, uh, for public consumption through a meat processor that we're working to uh, identify right now in the area. And also we're looking at expanding our response statewide. Um, we are going to be updating our response plan this spring to reflect the expanding footprint that I've been discussing about uh, where CWD is in Minnesota and try to improve our capacity and flexibility to respond when these new occurrences appear and we uh, wanna be more positioned and ready to respond. Some of the ideas that we've been working on are investigating some options for hunters to have a self mailing kit uh, that could be a, a way to facilitate more statewide surveillance and engage hunters in participating. We're working on what that could look like. Uh, other states have tried this before and we're in consultation with them to learn the, the, the good things and the bad things about efforts that they've tried. Um, it can really vary in costs from uh, you know, anywhere from uh, several hundred thousand to over two million, depending on how many hunters you really engage to participate. Uh, so all of these things we're taking into account as we think about how to, how to create this program. 
Something we've had really good success with recently is our partner sampling program, which is actually mostly uh, involves with taxidermists. And we've been targeting taxidermists in our surveillance areas where we've been collecting CWD samples. And they provide a high value sample because these are adult males that are more likely to have chronic wasting disease. And we pay them a small fee uh, to collect these samples for us. We now would like to take that, uh, that sampling program statewide and engage taxidermists across the state to help us really target those uh, those adult males um, as another way to gauge if we have disease in areas that we don't know. And again, upgrading and improving our current design for self-service sampling stations that we've been using for our hunters to create a, a more user-friendly interface and again, encourage more participation through voluntary sampling efforts. And as we look again to fall 2022 here, um, our footprint is now expanded to eight areas of the state. Um, we're right now uh, working to design what kind of a surveillance approach uh, we can do, uh, which would include both in-person uh, check stations as well as self-service options. Uh, we'll be needing to recruit additional interdivision staff to be able to provide service at this level. This is the largest footprint we've had in Minnesota, um, and we wanna be available to hunters to participate in this very important work. We'll be creating new management zones where the disease was recently discovered in Polk County and Itasca County, increasing hunting opportunity, as well as some other uh, regulations that go along with management zone, most important, importantly about carcass movement restrictions, providing dumpsters so hunters have some safe places to dispose of butcher remains, and, and then planning for what that, that cost could look like for this fall, our efforts that's underway uh, right now. And just in summary, a reminder that while this footprint uh, has expanded, this is still a very rare disease in Minnesota, given how many deer we've tested, how many deer are harvested every year, and, uh, and where we have found the disease. Um, we still have a very aggressive approach to protect our population uh, and our hunting heritage. We are willing to adapt as we see fit and assess our effectiveness along the way, which is why we believe it's important this year to take another look at our response plan and make it uh, as flexible as possible. And that we can't really be successful at all without the help of our hunters and cooperators and landowners, and business par partners to make CWD a priority and help protect our resource. With that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Carstensen. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Senator Rood. Dr. Carstensen, do we still have restrictions on our taxidermists as to what they can accept and from where they can accept animals for the purposes of taxidermy? Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, members. Yes, we do have a, an importation ban. That's a blanket ban for uh, whole carcasses to come into our state from basically anywhere outside of Minnesota. Uh, and that would include going for taxidermy. However, hunters can bring in uh, a, a pre-cleaned mount, basically caped with the brain material removed. That can be imported into the state legally um, and brought to any taxidermist that a hunter should, should choose. It's only that, uh, that entire carcass or the brain matter that might be contained in anything harvested outside of Minnesota that we still uh, have a ban on so that we don't import prions um, you know, inadvertently. Whoever. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and so thinking of hunters that probably head west maybe for uh, mule deer or, or uh, any other type of deer. Um, oh, I should ask, does this pertain to, to elk as well, that ban? Dr. Carstensen. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, Senator, this does attain to all servants uh, that might be harvested outside of Minnesota. Senator Weber. Uh, and yet, as I understand the information correctly, we have not detected ever any type of CWD activity in either uh, deer or moose. Is that correct, Dr. Carstensen? Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, Senator, it's correct that we have not detected uh, CWD in Minnesota's wild elk or moose population. It's been limited to white-tailed deer so far. Senator Weber. So for our, those hunters that may go out of state uh, to uh, do elk hunting or, or, or some other type of deer, um, uh, you know, Wyoming, Montana, et cetera, South Dakota, do all of those states have reported cases of CWD in them? Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, 
most of the states that you uh, mentioned uh, do have chronic wasting disease in parts or, of their state and in those species that you described. Yes, there are 29 states currently in the US and four Canadian provinces that have uh, cervid species uh, that are affected with chronic wasting disease, which, which is why our, our ban is a blanket ban for basically any state or province outside of Minnesota to try to protect us. Senator Weber. And just so I'm clear, Dr. Carsonson, in those states have have um, have elk, for example, been uh, di you know diagnosed with with CWD as even though we haven't had it in our elk population here. Dr. Carstensen. And I'm chair, Senator. Yes, that's correct. Elk okay. are included in the species in some of those states that do have chronic wasting disease. Okay, thank you. Members, are there other questions? Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Carsonson, for all your work on this. Uh, you, uh, you are the expert. I'm the layperson uh, who's going to ask you lay kind of questions because I think a lot of people have them. Uh, I'm from Rochester, so what I know about this is southeast Minnesota. My son's got some land uh, south of Houston, Minnesota full of cameras and so he's looking at uh, he's looking on his phone at the cameras all the time and tracking the deer and so on and so forth and and so you, you get you do that over time you get some impressions about what's going on uh, at least in that area of the state uh, specifically you know south of Houston I'm not sure if that's an endemic area for this or not but certainly it's in the general area and so my question kind of goes like this uh, so so I, I read here we've we've uh, we've uh, We've taken 106,000 deer. We've got 158 positives. Uh, just some simple math. That's like uh, 0.015 percent. Pardon me, 0 0.15. Maybe I said that. 15 uh, percent. You know, pretty pretty low. Uh, and then some work in 21. It's about 0.2 percent. So, so we've got this uh, this endemic uh, situation there. We've got this. Uh, we've got this prion. Uh, Certainly within our deer population, but it's like you said, it's uh, it's not terribly prevalent at those low percentages. But so so what's what's our goal? That's what I'm trying to understand. We we can continue to shoot and shoot and shoot and take these deer, and uh, probably those that get in in car accidents with them uh, don't care a lot. But uh, but the hunters do. You know, if you come back in 20 years, uh, this prion's still going to be around. We're still going to be shooting deer and. You know what's what's the end game here? I mean, is there an end game, or or is the end game just to continue to to uh, as uh, cases occur to to go in and to uh, I think the word is call and and just try to keep the numbers down as much as possible and and uh, and know that as we do this, uh, as we shoot these deers, we're 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 really the probability of getting one with the with CWD is this is way less than 1% even. So I'm just trying to think what, what the strategy is, what's the end game? That's uh, because we are taking, I will tell you, my son says he doesn't see on his cameras near the deer he used to, uh, south of Houston, Minnesota. And that's that's big buck country, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Karstensen. Madam Chair, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, that's a question we get often about what is our goal? What is the long term? And I, I would say in the, in the very basic sense, our goal is to have a very healthy deer population in Minnesota for future generations. And that's our charge. And when we're in a position like Minnesota, where we have disease really early in the inflection period, so we have recent introductions of disease to have such low prevalence on, on the landscape, while it's unfortunate that we found any, we're also uh, fortunate that it is at such the low prevalences that you mentioned. And some of the tools that we're trying to use are to really mitigate the, the possible effects of spread of that disease to other parts of the state. And the reason that we use the culling tool that you mentioned um, is to try to keep prevalence <clears throat> low where the disease has been found to exist, like the Fillmore County and Winona County areas. We're also trying to, to keep our prevalences low because we can look to other states, particularly our neighbor to Wisconsin, to, our, to the east, and see what this disease can start to look like when prevalences increase to 
50% in males and 30% in adult females in the southern part of their state, where this is really affecting uh, hunters' interest in going out to even hunt deer, as well as concerns about taking that venison home when nearly half of the deer in those areas might be infected. We certainly don't want that future for Minnesota. Um, so we're also working really closely with scientists like the MinPro team at the University of Minnesota, helping get any better diagnostic, diagnostics in play and also better tools that we're hoping will be available to us in the future to help manage this disease. We currently lack some ability to denature prions on the landscape, or there isn't a vaccine for wild deer or wild elk, but these are all things that really smart scientists are working on, and we are helping them uh, and, and hoping that they can have some success. And in between then, we really just want to keep our herd as healthy as possible and try to suppress the effects this disease could have, because we do know that it's always fatal, and if left unchecked, it increases throughout the herd over time. And we could experience prevalences like they do in Colorado and Wyoming that are over 40% uh, and even Wisconsin. And we're just uh, hoping to mitigate that with our, our approaches. Thank, thank, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ms. Carson. And it, uh, that, that was very helpful. I, I, I keep thinking though, I, I mean, in, in the winter, uh, with ice on the Mississippi, these these deer, and I suspect they can swim as well. But uh, uh, if Wisconsin's not taking the the, and, and I'm not throwing rocks. I don't mean to do that. But if, if they're not taking the, the giving this the attention we are, uh, you know, I don't. I, I suspect DNR is in conversation with the on a multi-state basis. But uh, it, it it this this is if, if this is our strategy, then my goodness sakes. Uh, we can do all we want in Southeast Minnesota, but uh, it, you know, at certain places, the river is not all that wide down there. And it certainly does freeze in the winter time in, in many cases, uh, and deer are going to migrate and will, uh, I suspect uh, we know that. But uh, so, so, my, so my, my, my point is, and I think you've answered it pretty well, uh, our, our strategy is just to keep the prevalence down and, and hopefully uh, uh, grow, more, grow more good uninfected deer than, uh, and obviously uh, those that, that, that do ultimately become infected and keep the sport alive. So thank you so much. I, I do appreciate your work. Senator Weber. Thank you, Senator Rood. Um, one of the things that happened, I think it was with the Beltrami herd where there was a CW, this was in a, um, a deer farm where there had been detection last year. And that herd I believe was uh, called and and uh, and destroyed, if I remember right. Um, and I remember in a meeting late last session where I was somewhat perturbed by the fact that we keep hearing about working towards a live detection. Um, and I asked the question if there had been any effort made on these animals that were going to be destroyed anyway uh, to further the testing for a live test. And, and there was nothing done. They were just simply destroyed and, and uh, uh, gotten rid of. Uh, do we have any type of plan in place, Dr. Karstensen, that if such a detection should be found in the future, that uh, between the Board of Animal Health and the uh, DNR, that there will be an effort made to further the live detection uh, capabilities uh, in that scenario? Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, thank you for the question. And I, I can't agree with you more about what a val valuable resource that is at the time of these uh, infections occurring to be able to take samples, you know, uh, anti-mortem while the animals are still alive to help improve our diagnostic capabilities. And there were samples collected from that Beltrami farm uh, for uh, the MinPro team at the University of Minnesota. They did get approval uh, through USDA and the Board of Animal Health. Uh, they weren't uh, themselves at the farm, but they did have scientists from USDA uh, collecting samples. And then when those animals were euthanized, um, 
uh, they were able to collect additional tissues at the diagnostic lab at the University of Minnesota. So there, there has been uh, work in that area, and I think there, uh, there should be more. Um, in the past, there were some barriers for uh, uh, some scientists to get on the facilities at the time when these animals were going to be depopped. It had to do with um, ownership of the materials and different policies between USDA and the board, and those things have been improving. And I, I have seen in the last few uh, situations in Minnesota, a lot more more um, access to scientists to try to gain samples. It's probably not perfect yet uh, in that sense, but there's definitely progress that has been made, uh, especially considering uh, the interests of MinPro and the investment our state has done in their, on their diagnostic front. So there, there's progress there, but I think we can still do more with some of the environmental sampling uh, and other things that could occur at these facilities over time to look at um, types of things that denature uh, some of the, the ground um, and help really decontaminate these facilities. So that does require additional work into the future. Senator Weber. One follow-up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And is that information being shared with the deer farm industry? So to help them gain more understanding of their operations and what, um, what uh, uh, a, you know, any type of instance is found, uh, you know, in terms of their deer and their interactions uh, with one another and, and, uh, uh, helping to provide them additional data uh, in terms of keeping their operations as safe as possible. Dr. Carstensen. Oh, Madam Chair, Senator, I do believe that both uh, the Board of Animal Health and MinPro have done specific outreach to both uh, deer farmers and elk farmers in Minnesota about their research. And, um, and my understanding is they haven't had a lot of um, willingness to have uh, to get on facilities in certain circumstances because there's still uncertainty about um what would be the results of positive tests when they're conducted in this research platform um, using non-validated methods? And there's a lot of concerns from, uh, from some of the uh, farmers about um, you know, what it might mean for their business practices. And so there's been reluctance to, to engage in some of the research without understanding outcomes. And so I think that's an area that, uh, that they're, they're continuing to discuss. And I know the MinPro team has been very active uh, trying to communicate with both deer and elk farmers to engage them in the science and help them be part of the solution. So I would say that there's progress there, but uh, that more, we, more work needs to be done. Senator Thank, you. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Sengen. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, if I don't get it asked now, I, I'll never... I'll never get it asked. So, uh, Mrs. Carstensen, on, on the front, there, one of our handouts here talked about the 106,000 deer uh, that have been uh, tested uh, and 158 positive. Were those 106 uh, uh, deer that were all, I don't think they were all called. I think there were, some of these were hunted, right? This is a combination between those hunted and those called, if you will. Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, Senator, yeah, that's nearly almost hunted deer. So that's the majority of our surveillance that we've done since 2002 has been working with our hunters and obtaining samples from deer that are already harvested uh, in hunting opportunities. It's only a small subset of animals that are called uh, during these different events we've had in recent years. Just several hundred each winter are, are called uh, very strategically, particularly in the Southeast. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was kind of an important question for me. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carstensen, I, I would just like to comment. So when, um, when we had the uh, Brainerd outbreak, um, it was really kind of devastating to our hunters. And we had the, the farm there that, you know, um, and, I, and I think people think that the testing is so easy. And I, I remember going out on opening day and um, I actually went to the testing stations because I wanted to see what was going on and how it was done. And we had uh, quite a few students from the veterinarian um, classes uh, come and help. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, we butcher our own deer in, in the grad. We have great setup. And I would tell you that would be challenging for us to find the lymph nodes um, to do the testing. And so it's not an easy thing. So I, I appreciate the fact that, that the DNR is out there helping hunters doing the testing because it's, it's not an easy thing. And so when we talk about that, um, I just want people to realize that that the testing and the taking of the lymph nodes and sending them in isn't as easy as it as you might think. So as we work forward and and I think the science has really brought us um, uh, a long way. Uh, this committee 
Um, you remember that we um, added a million dollars to the legacy amendment last year because of the Beltrami incident and so that we could send it to the University of Minnesota to understand the prions and how they affected that. Um, but I will tell you up in Beltrami County, we also spent $200,000 on, on fencing in an area that we will have to monitor for 20 years. So as we move forward, this is a, um, something that we have to respond to. We have to keep the, the herd um, healthy for generations. I have four generations hunting out at our camp right now, and I hope to continue that. So it's a project well worth pursuing to keep the herd healthy. And I hope that science will help us through with better testing and rapid testing so that we, we don't have to destroy the deer. And um, I just thank you for your work because it's not, an, it's not been easy um, trying to get through this process um, with something that's very, um, very much a heritage in Minnesota. So members, other questions? With thank, that, thank you, um, Dr. Karstensen for your presentation today. Thank you everyone for your time. And members seeing no um, further business in front of our committee, we are adjourned.